The Famous Notes on the Bhagavad Gita by William Quain Judge Originally published by United Lodge of Theosophists from November 1913 to February 1907 If the title of this sacred Hindu poem were paraphrased, it would read The Holy Song of God Himself who at the beginning of Kali Yuga, or the Dark Age, descended upon earth to aid and instruct man. Gita means song, and Bhagavad is one of the names of Krishna. Krishna was an avatar. According to the views of the Brahmins, we are now in Kali Yuga, which began about the time of Krishna's appearance. He is said to have descended in order to start among men those moral and philosophical ideas which were necessary to be known during the revolution of the age, at the end of which, after a brief period of darkness, a better age will begin. The composition of this poem is attributed to Vyasa, and as he is also said to have given the Vedas to men, a discussion about dates would not be profitable and can well stand over until some other occasion. The Bhagavad Gita is a portion of the Mahabharata, the great epic of India. The Mahabharata is so called because it contains the general history of the house Bharat, and the prefix Maha signifies great. Its more definite object, however, is to give an account of the wars of the Kurus and Pandus, two great branches of the family. And that portion included in our poem is the sublime philosophical and metaphysical dialogue held by Krishna with Arjuna on the eve of a battle between the two aspirants for dominion. The scene of the battle is laid on the plain called Kurukestra, a strip of land near Delhi, between the Indus, the Ganges, and the Himalayan mountains. Many European translators and commentators, being ignorant of the psychological system of the Hindus, which really underlies every word of this poem, have regarded this plain and the battle as just those two things and no more. Some have gone so far as to give the commercial product of the country at the supposed period, so that readers might be able, forsooth, in that way to know the motives that prompted the two princes to enter into a bloody internecine conflict. No doubt such a conflict did take place, for man is continually imitating the higher spiritual planes, and a great sage could easily adopt a human event in order to erect a noble philosophical system upon such an allegorical foundation. In one aspect, history gives us merely the small or great occurrences of man's progress, but in another, any one great historical epoch will give us a picture of the evolution in man in the mass of any corresponding faculty of the individual soul. So we see here and there Western minds wondering why such a highly tuned metaphysical discussion should be disfigured by warfare of savages. Such is the materializing influence of Western culture that it is hardly able to admit any high meaning in a portion of the poem which confessedly it has not yet come to fully understand. Before the Upanishads can be properly rendered, the Indian psychological system must be understood, and even when its existence is admitted, the English-speaking person will meet the great difficulty arising from an absence of words in that language which correspond to the ideas so frequently found in the Sanskrit. Thus we have to wait until a new set of words have been born to express the new ideas not yet existing in the civilization of the West. The location of the plain on which this battle was fought is important, as well as are also the very rivers and mountains by which it is bounded. And equally as needful to be understood or at least guessed at are the names of the respective princes. The very place in the Mahabharata in which this episode is inserted has deep significance, 
and we cannot afford to ignore anything whatever that is connected with the events. If we merely imagine that Vyasa or Krishna took the sacred plane of Kurukshetra and the great battle as simply accessories to his discourse, which we can easily discard, the whole force of the dialogue will be lost. Although the Bhagavad Gita is a small work, there have been written upon it among the Hindus more commentaries than those upon the revelation of St. John among the Christians. I do not intend to go into those commentaries, because on the one hand I am not a Sanskrit scholar, and on the other it would not tend to great profit. Many of them are fanciful, some unwarrantable, and those that are value can be consulted by anyone anxious to pursue that line of inquiry. What I propose here to myself and to all who may read these papers is to study the Bhagavad Gita by the light of that spiritual lamp, be it small or great, which the Supreme Soul will feed and increase within us if we attend to its behests and diligently inquire after it. Such, at least, is the promise by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, the song celestial. In the few introductory lines with which I took up this subject, it was stated that, not being a Sanskrit scholar, I did not intend to go into the commentaries upon the poem in that language. The great mass of those commentaries have looked at the dialogue from various standpoints. Many later Hindu students have not gone beyond the explanations made by Sankarasharya, and nearly all refuse to do more than transliterate the names of the different personages referred to in the first chapter. But there is the highest authority for reading this poem between the lines. The Vedas themselves say that what we see of them is only the disclosed Veda, and that one should strive to get above this disclosed word. It is here clearly implied that the undisclosed Vedas must be hidden or contained in that which is apparent to the outer senses. Did we not have this privilege, then surely we will be reduced to obtaining true knowledge solely from the facts of experience as suffered by the mortal frame and fall into the gross error of the materialists who claim that mind is only an effect produced by the physical brain molecules coming into motion. We would also have to follow the canonical rule that conscience is a safe guide only when it is regulated by an external law such as the law of the church or of the Brahmanical caste. But we very well know that within the material, apparent, or disclosed man exists the real one who is undisclosed. This valuable privilege of looking for the inner sense, while not straining after impossible meanings in the text, is permitted to all sincere students of any holy scriptures, Christian or pagan. And in the poem itself, Krishna declares that he will feed the lamp of spiritual wisdom so that the real meaning of his words may be known. So too, the Upanishads uphold the existence of a faculty together with the right to use it, whereby one can plainly discern the real or undisclosed meaning of holy books. Indeed, there is a school of occultists who hold, as we think with reason, that the power may be so developed by devoted persons that even upon hearing the words of a holy book read in a totally unfamiliar language, the true meaning and drift of the strange sentences become instantly known. Note. We have in mind an incident where a person of some slight development in this direction heard read several verses from the Vedas in Sanskrit, with which he had no acquaintance, and instantly told what the verses were about. End of note. The Christian commentators all allow that, in studying their Bible, the spirit must be attended to, and not the letter. 
This spirit is that undisclosed Veda which must be looked for between the lines. Nor should the Western student of the poem be deterred from any attempt to get at the real meaning by the attitude of the Brahmins, who hold that only Brahmins can be told this real meaning, and because Krishna did not make it plain, it may not be made plain now to Sudras, or low-caste people. Were this view to prevail, then the whole Western body of theosophists would be excluded from using this important book, inasmuch as all persons, not Hindus, are necessarily of Sudra caste. Krishna did not make such an exclusion, which is only priestcraft. He was himself of shepherd caste, and not a Brahmin, and he says that anyone who listens to his words will receive great benefit. The sole limitation made by him is that one in which he declares that these things must not be taught to those who do not want to listen, which is just the same direction as that given by Jesus of Nazareth when he said, Cast not your pearls before swine. But as our minds work very much upon suggestion or clues, and might in the absence of any hints as to where those clues are placed be liable to altogether overlook the point, we must bear in mind the existence among the Aryans of a psychological system that gives substance and impulse to utterances declared by many Orientalists to be wholly unworthy of attention from a man of the 19th century civilization. Nor need we be repulsed from our task because of a small acquaintance with that Aryan psychology. The moment we are aware of its existence in the poem, our inner self is ready to help the outer man to grasp after it. And in the noble pursuit of these great philosophical and moral truths, which is only our eternal endeavor to realize them as part of our being, we can patiently wait for a perfect knowledge of the anatomy and functions of the inner man. Western Sanskritists have translated many important words into the very lowest of their real meanings, being drawn away from the truth by the incomplete Western psychological and spiritual knowledge, or have mixed them up hopelessly. Such words as karma, and dharma are not understood. Dharma means law and is generally turned into duty, or said to refer merely to some rule depending upon human convention, whereas it means an inherent property of the faculties or of the whole man, or even of anything in the cosmos. Thus it is said that it is the duty or dharma of fire to burn. It always will burn and thus do its whole duty, having no consciousness, while man alone has the power to retard his journey to the heart of the sun by refusing to perform his properly appointed and plainly evident dharma. So again, when we read in the Bhagavad Gita that those who depart this life in the bright half of the moon, in the six months of the sun's northern course, will go to eternal salvation, while others who depart in the gloomy night of the moon's dark season, while the sun is in the southern half of its path, ascend for a time to the moon's region to be reborn on this earth. Our Orientalists tell us this is sheer folly, and we are unable to contradict them. But if we know that the Aryans, with a comprehensive knowledge of the vast and never inharmonious correspondence reigning throughout the macrocosm in speaking thus, meant to admit that the human being may be or not in a state of development in strict conformity to the bright or dark moon, the verse becomes clear. The materialistic critic will take the verse in the fourth chapter which says that he who eats of the ambrosia left from a sacrifice passes into the supreme spirit and asks us how the eating of the remnants of a burnt offering can confer salvation. When, however, we know that man is the altar and the sacrifice and that this ambrosia is the perfection of spiritual cultivation which he eats or incorporates into his being, the Aryan is vindicated and we are saved from despair. 
A strange similarity on one point may be noticed between our poem and the old Hebrew record. The Jews were prepared by certain experiences to enter into the promised land, but were unable to do so until they had engaged in mighty conflicts with Hivites, Jebusites, Perizites, and Amalekites. Here we find that the very opening verse signalizes a war. The old blind king Tritarashastra asks his prime minister to tell him what these opposing forces of Pandus and Kurus have been doing assembled as they are resolved upon war. So too the Jews assembled upon the borders of the promised land, resolved on conflict, and sustained in their resolve by the declarations of their God, who had brought them out of the darkness of Egypt, carried on the fight. Egypt was the place where they had, in mystic language, obtained corporification, and stands for antenatal states, for unformed chaotic periods in the beginning of evolution for the gestation in the womb. We are on the eve of a gigantic combat. We are to rush into the midst of a conflict of savages. If this opening verse is understood as it was meant, we are given the key to a magnificent system and shall not fall into the error of asserting that the unity of the poem is destroyed. Tritarashtra is blind because the body as such is blind in every way. Someone has said, Goethe, I think, that the old pagan religions taught men to look up, to aspire continually toward the greatness which was really his to achieve, and thus led him to regard himself as but little less potentially than a god while the attitude of man under the Christian system is one of humility, of bowed head and lowered eyes in the presence of his God. In approaching the, quote, jealous God, unquote, of the Mosaic dispensation, it is not permissible to assume an erect possession. This change of attitude becomes necessary as soon as we postulate a deity who is outside and beyond us. And yet it is not due to the Christian scriptures in themselves, but solely to the wrong interpretation given them by priests and churches, and easily believed by a weak humanity that needs a support beyond itself on which to lean. The Arians, holding that man in his essence is God, naturally looked up to him and referred everything to him. They therefore attributed to the material of the body no power of sight or feeling, and so the Ritarashtra, who is material existence, in which thirst for its renewal in hers, is blind. The eye cannot see, nor the ear hear of themselves. In the Upanishads the pupil is asked, What is the sight of the eye and the hearing of the ear? replying that these powers reside solely with inner organs of the soul, using the material body as the means for experiencing the phenomena of material life. Without the presence of this indwelling, informing, hearing and seeing power, or being, this collection of particles now defined as body is dead or blind. These philosophers were not behind our 19th century. Boscovich, the Italian, Faraday, Fisk and other moderns have concluded that we cannot even see or know the matter of which these bodies and the different substances about us are made up, and that the ultimate resolution is not into atoms finally divided, but into points of dynamic force and therefore we cannot know a piece of iron, we only know the phenomena it produces. This position is an ancient Aryan one, with another added, that the real perceiver of those phenomena is the self. It is only by an acceptance of this philosophy that we will ever comprehend the facts of nature which our science is so laboriously noting and classifying.
But that science ignores a large mass of phenomena well known to spiritualists here and to ascetics in Asia, because the actual existence of the self as the final support of every phase of consciousness is denied. The disappearance of the ascetic is a possibility, but the West denies it, while it is doubtful if even spiritists will admit that any living man can cause that phenomena known as form to disappear. They are, however, willing to grant that a materialized spirit form may disappear, or that some mediums are living who have disappeared while sitting in a chair either as an actual dissipation of molecules or by being covered as with a veil. Note, for an instance, see Colonel Alcott's People from the Other World, respecting a female medium. End of note. In those instances, the thing happened without knowledge or effort on the part of the medium, who was a passive agent. But the Eastern ascetic possessing the power of disappearing is a person who has meditated upon the real basis of what we know as form, with the doctrine ever in view as stated by Voskovitz and Faraday that these phenomena are not realities per se, and adding that all must be referred to the self. And so we find Patanjali in his compilation of yoga aphorisms stating the matter. In his 21st aphorism, Book 3, he says that the ascetic being aware that form as such is nothing can cause himself to disappear. Note, the aphorism reads, By performing sanyama, restraint, or meditation, about form, its power of being apprehended by the seer's eye being checked, and luminousness, the property of the organ of sight having no connection with its object, that is the form. The result is the disappearance of the ascetic. End of note. It is not difficult to explain this as a species of hypnotism or psychologizing performed by the ascetic, but such sort of explaining is only the modern method of getting out of a difficulty by stating it over again in new terms. Not until it is admitted that the self eternally persists and is always unmodified will any real knowledge be acquired by us respecting these matters. In this, Patanjali is very clear in his 17th aphorism, Book 4, where he says, The modifications of the mental state are always known because the presiding spirit is not modified. We must admit the blindness of Dhritarashtra as body, and that our consciousness and ability to know anything whatever of the modifications going on in the organism are due to the presiding spirit. So this old blind Raja is that part of man which, containing the principle of thirst for existence, holds material life. The Ganges, bounding his plane on one side, typifies the sacred stream of spiritual life incarnated here. At first it flows down, unperceived by us, through the spiritual spheres, coming at last into what we call matter, where it manifests itself, but yet remains unseen, until at last it flows into the sea, or death, to be drawn up again by the sun, or the karma of reincarnation. The plain is sacred because it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Kurukshetra should then read, the body which is acquired by karma. So the king does not ask what this body itself has been doing, but what have the followers of material existence, that is, the entire host of lower elements in man by which he is attached to physical life, and the followers of Pandu, that is, the entire set of spiritual faculties, been doing on this sacred plane? 
It follows then that the enumeration of generals and commanders gone into by the prime minister in reply to the king must be a catalogue of all the low and high faculties in man, containing also in the names adopted clues to powers of our being only at present dimly guessed at in the West, or included in such vague terms as brain and mind. We find these generals given their appropriate places upon either side, and see also that they have assigned to them various distinctive weapons, which in many cases are flourished or exhibited in their preliminary movements, so that our attention may be drawn to them. Salutation to Krishna, the Lord of Devotion the God of religion, the never-failing help of those who trust in him. We now have discovered that the poem is not disfigured by this account of a conflict that begins in the first chapter, to be then dropped while the two great actors retire to their chariot for a discussion. This description of forces and the first effect on Aryuna of his survey show us that we are now to learn from Krishna what is the duty of man in his warfare with all the forces and tendencies of his nature. Instead of the conflict being a blemish to the poem, it is a necessary and valuable portion. We see that the fight is to be fought by every human being, whether he lives in India or not, for it is raging on the sacred plane of our body. Each one of us, then, is Aryuna. In the Sanskrit, the first chapter is called Aryun Vishad, which in English means the despair and despondency of Aryuna. Some have called it the survey of army, but while truly an army is surveyed, that is not the essential meaning intended. It is the result of the survey we are to consider, and that result upon Aryuna, who is the person most interested, the one who is the chief questioner and beneficiary throughout the whole action of the poem, is despondency. The cause of this despondency is to be inquired into. Aryuna, in the flush of determination and before any analysis of either the consequences to himself or to others who might become involved, entered the conflict after having chosen Krishna as his charioteer. The forces are drawn up in line of battle, and he rides out to survey them. At once he sees ranged against him relatives of every class, in their turn preparing to destroy others, their relatives, friends and acquaintances, as well as Aryunas, who are enlisted on his side. Turning to Krishna, he says that he cannot engage in such a war, that he perceives only evil omens, and that even if the opposers, being ignorant, may be willing to fight with such dreadful consequences in view, he cannot do so, but must give up the battle ere it is begun. Thereupon, quote, Aryuna, whose heart was troubled with grief, let fall his bow and arrows, and sat down on the bench of his chariot. Unquote. Every student of occultism, theosophy, or true religion, all being the one thing, will go through Aryuna's experiences. Attract by the beauty or other seductive quality for him of this study, he enters upon the prosecution of it, and soon discovers that he arouses two sets of forces. One of them consists of all his friends and relations who do not view life as he does, who are wedded to the established order, and think him a fool for devoting any attention to anything else, while the general mass of his acquaintances and those whom he meets in the world instinctively array themselves against one who is thus starting upon a crusade that begins with his own follies and faults, but must end in a condemnation of theirs, if only by the force of example. The other opponents are far more difficult to meet, because they have their camp and base of action upon the astral and other hidden planes. 
They are all his low attendances and faculties that up to this time have been in the sole service of material life. By the mere force of moral gravity, they fly to the other side, where they assist his living friends and relatives in their struggle against him. They have more efficiency in producing despondency than anything else. In the poem it is referred to in the words addressed by Aryuna to Krishna, quote, I am not able to stand, for my understanding, as it were, turneth round, and I behold inauspicious omens on all sides. Unquote. All of us are brought to this study by our own request made to our higher self, who is Krishna. Aryuna requested Krishna to be his charioteer and to drive him forth between the two armies. It does not matter whether he now is consciously aware of having made the request, nor whether it was made as a specific act, in this life or in many other precedent one. It was made, and it has to be answered at the right time. Some of us have asked this many times before, in ancient births of ours, in other bodies and other lands. Others are making the request now but it is more than likely in the case of those who are spurred on to intense effort and longing to know the truth and to strive for unity with God that they have put up the petition ages since. So now Krishna, the charioteer of this body with its horses, the mind, drives us forth so that we may stand with our higher self and all the tendencies connected with it on one side and all the lower but not all necessarily evil, principles on the other. The student may, perhaps, with ease face the crowd of friends and relatives, having probably gone through that experience in other lives, and is now proof against it. But he is not proof against the first dark shadow of despair and ill result that falls upon him. Every elemental that he has vivified by evil thinking now casts upon him the thought, after all, it is no use. I cannot win. If I did, the gain would be nothing. I can see no great or lasting result to be attained, for all, all is impermanent. This dreadful feeling is sure in each case to supervene, and we might as well be prepared for it. We cannot always live on the enthusiasm of heavenly joys. The rosy hue of dawn does not reach round the world. It chases darkness. Let us be prepared for it, not only at the first stage, but all along in our progress to the holy seat, for it comes at each pause, at that slight pause when we are about to begin another breath, to take another step, to pass into another condition. And here it is wise, turning to the eighteenth and last chapter of the poem, to read the words of the immortal master of life. Quote, From a confidence in thine own self-sufficiency, thou mayst think that thou wilt not fight. Such is a fallacious determination, for the principles of thy nature will compel thee. Being confined to actions by the duties of thy natural calling, thou wilt involuntarily do that from necessity, which thou wantest through ignorance to avoid. Unquote. In this, Krishna uses the very argument advanced by Arjuna against the fight as one in its favor. In the chapter we are considering, Aryuna repeats the old Brahmanical injunction against those who break up the eternal institutions of caste and tribe, for, as he says, the penalty annexed is a sojourn in hell, since, when the caste and tribe are destroyed, the ancestors, being deprived of the rites of funeral cakes and liberations of water, fall from heaven, and the whole tribe is thus lost. Note Note, this reference by Aryuna is to the immemorial custom of the son or descendants offering to the departed at stated times 
funeral cakes and water called Shraddha and Pinda, one of the so-called superstitions of the Hindus. It has always been a great question with me whether the boasted freedom from superstition of Western 19th century civilization is an unmixed good or any evidence of real progress. All such ancient forms have been swept away, and with them nearly every vestige of true religious feeling, leaving only an unquenchable thirst for money and power. In the present ignorance of the true reason at the bottom of these forms, the assertion is made that they meant nothing whatever. But in the Catholic Church it is continued, and to some extent believed in, as is shown in their masses for the dead. Surely these masses would not be offered if supposed to have no effect on the state of those for whom they are offered. Although greatly corrupted and debased, it is in this church alone that these old practices are preserved. Shraddha and Pinda are now neglected because the inner constitution of man and the constitution of the macrocosm are not understood in such a way as to make the ceremony of the slightest use. End of note. But Krishna shows as above that each man is naturally, by his bodily tendencies, compelled to do the acts of some particular calling, and that body with its tendencies are merely the manifestation of what the inner man is, as the result of all his former thoughts up to that incarnation. So he is forced by nature's law, which is his own, to be born just where he must have the experience that is needed. And Aryuna, being a warrior, is compelled to fight, whether he will or no. In another chapter, the institution of caste is more particularly referred to, and there we will have occasion to go into that subject with more detail. As stated in the last paper, the substratum, or support, for the whole cosmos is the presiding spirit, and all the various changes in life, whether of a material nature or solely in mental states, are cognizable because the presiding spirit within is not modifiable. Were it otherwise, then we would have no memory, for with each passing event we, becoming merged in it, could not remember anything, that is, we could see no changes. There must therefore be something eternally persisting, which is the witness and perceiver of every passing change, itself unchangeable. All objects and all states of what Western philosophers called mind are modifications, for in order to be seen or known by us there must be some change, either partial or total, from a precedent state. The perceiver of these changes is the inner man, Aryuna Krishna. This leads us to the conviction that there must be a universal presiding spirit, the producer as well as spectator of all this collection of animate and inanimate things. The philosophy taught by Krishna holds that at first this spirit, so called however by me only for the purpose of the discussion, remained in a state of quiet with no objects, because as yet there was no modification. But resolving to create, or rather to emanate the universe, it formed a picture of what should be. And this at once was a modification willingly brought about in the hitherto wholly unmodified spirit. Thereupon the divine idea was gradually expanded, coming forth into objectivity, while the essence of the preceding spirit remained unmodified and became the perceiver of its own expanded idea. Its modifications are visible and invisible nature. Its essence then differentiates itself continually in various directions, becoming the immortal part of each man, the Krishna who talks to Arjuna. Coming like a spark from the central fire, it partakes of that nature that is the quality of being unmodifiable and assumes to itself as a cover, so to speak, the human body, and thus, being in essence unmodified, it has the capacity to perceive all the changes going on around the body. 
It is also, of course, inherent in all nature. This self must be recognized as being within, pondered over, and as much as possible understood, if we are to gain any true knowledge. We have thus quickly, and perhaps in an inadequate way, come down to a consideration of Arjuna as composed of all these generals and heroes enumerated in this chapter, and who are, as we said, the various powers, passions, and qualities included in the Western terms brain and mind. Modern physical, mental, and psychological sciences have as yet but scratched the surface of that which they are engaged in examining. Physical science confessedly is empiric, knowing but the very outposts of the laws of nature, and our psychology is in a worse state. The latter has less chance for arriving at the truth than physical science, because scientists are proceeding to a gradual demonstration of natural laws by careful examination of facts easily observable. But psychology is a something which demands the pursuit of another method than that of science or those now observed. It would avail nothing at present to specify the Aryan nomenclature for all the sheets, as they call them, that envelope the soul, because we as yet have not acquired the necessary ideas. Of what use is it to say that certain impressions reside in the Anandamava sheath, but there is such a one, whether we call it by that name or by any other? We can, however, believe that the soul, in order to at last reach the objective plane where its experience is gained, placed upon itself, one after the other, various sheets, each having its peculiar property and function. The mere physical brain is thus seen to be only the material organ first used by the real percipient in receiving or conveying ideas and perceptions, and so with all the other organs, they are only the special seats for centralizing the power of the real man in order to experience the modifications of nature at that particular spot. Who is the sufferer from this despondency? It is our false personality, as it has been called in the theosophical literature, as distinguished from Krishna, the higher self, which is oppressed by the immediate resistance offered by all the lower part of our nature, and by those persons with whom we are most closely connected as soon as we begin to draw them away from all old habits and to present a new style of thinking for their consideration. For Aryuna, sinking down upon the seat of that chariot which is his body, fell back upon his own nature, and found therein the elements of search and courage, as well as those previous ones of gloom which arise first, being nearer the natural man. Reliance and pressure upon our own inner nature, in moments of darkness, are sure to be answered by the voice of Krishna, the inner guide. The first consequences of the despondency are to make us feel that the battle we have invited ought not to be carried on, and we then are almost overwhelmed with the desire to give it up. Some do give it up to begin it again in a succeeding life, while others, like Aryuna, listen to the voice of Krishna and bravely fight it out to the end. Thus, in the Upanishads, in the holy Bhagavad Gita, in the science of the Supreme Spirit, in the book of devotion, in the colloquy between the holy Krishna and Aryuna, stands the first chapter by name, The Despondency of Aryuna. Salutation to the god of battles, to the charioteer, to him who disposeth the forces aright, who leadeth us on to victory, with whom alone success is certain that he may guide us to where the never-dying light shineth. Om. The First Abyss Salutation to the prowess of Krishna. May it be with us in the fight, strengthening our hearts, that they faint not in the gloomy night that follows in the path of the day. The first chapter is ended. 
In one aspect, the Bhagavad Gita is a personal book. It is for each man, and it is in that way we have so far considered it. Some have called it obscure, and others a book which deals solely with the great principles of nature, with only great questions of cosmogony, with difficult and bewildering questions relating to the first cause, and still others think it is contradictory and vague. But this first scene in the great colloquy is plain. It has the din of arms, the movement of battalions, and the disposition of forces with their generals. No one need feel any hesitation now, for we are face to face with ourselves. The weak man, or he who does not care for truth, no matter where it leads, had better shut this book now unless he can go on reading the poem with a fixed intention of applying it to himself, it will do him no good whatever. He may say, however, that he will read it for what it may seem to contain, but if he reads to the end of time and does not fairly regard this first lecture, his knowledge gained further on will be no knowledge. It is indeed the book of the great mystery. But that problem was never solved for anyone. It must be settled and solved by each one for himself. No doubt it was for this reason that Vyasa, to whom the poem is attributed, placed this conflict, in which the principal characters are Arjuna and Krishna, at the outset. It would have been easier to have made them sit down for a philosophical discourse beforehand in which reasons pro and con regarding any battle would be discussed, and then after all that was done to show as Arjuna encouraged and equipped, entering upon the war sure of victory because he had spent much time in dispelling his doubts. But instead of doing this, he pictures the impetuous Aryuna precipitating the battle before he had considered whom it was he had to fight. It does not appear in the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna had induced Aryuna, as was the case, to make the war for the purpose of regaining his kingdom. While stirring him up to it, Krishna had wisely refrained from telling that which Aryuna finds out on the first day that they had to oppose all these friends, kinsmen and preceptors. It was a wise reticence. If we completely apprehend the enormous power of our passions and various tendencies, most of us would throw up the fight in advance, for nothing would persuade us that any power within could withstand against such overwhelming odds. For us, then, the incitement to fight is found not so much in any conversation that we hold now with Krishna, but in the impulses which are carried across, again and again, from incarnation to incarnation. We take up the gauge over and over, life after life, in experience after experience, never completely defeated if we always look to Krishna, our higher self. And in the tale of Aryuna we find this also, for in a succeeding book called Anugita is an account of the hero walking with Krishna through the palace of Maya. The battle over for the time, Aryuna tells his friend that he has really forgotten much that he had told him in Bhagavad Gita and asks for a succinct repetition. This is given to him by the great warrior. The palace of Maya is the body of illusion built up around us by desire. In our last births we had all the advice given in this poem, and walking today through the palace, which sometimes seems so lovely, we now and then have reminiscences from the past. Sometimes we stoutly take up the fight, but surely, if we have listened to the guide aright, we will compel ourselves at last to carry it out until finished. In coming to the conclusion of this first chapter, we reach the first abyss. It is not the great abyss, albeit it may seem to us in our experience to be the greatest. We are now vis-à-vis -vis with our own despair, and doubt his companion. Many a student of theosophy has in our own sight reached this point, 
all true students do. Like a little child who first ventures from the parents' side, we are frightened at what seems new to us, and dropping our weapons attempt to get away. But in the pursuit of theosophy it is not possible to go back, because the abyss is behind us. There is in nature a law that operates in every department, whether moral or physical, and which may now be called that of undulation, and then that of inhibition, while at other times it reappears as vibration, and still again as attraction and repulsion. But all these changes are only apparent, because at bottom it is the same. Among vegetables it causes the sap to flow up the tree in one way, and I will not permit it to return in the same direction. In our own blood circulation we find the blood propelled from the heart, and that nature has provided little valves which will not permit it to return to the heart by the way it came, but by the way provided. Medical and anatomical science are not quite sure what it is that causes the blood to pass these valves, whether it is pressure from behind communicated by the heart, or the pressure by atmosphere from without which gently squeezes, as it were, the blood upon its way. But the occultist does not find himself limited by these empirical deductions. He goes at once to the centre and declares that the impulse is from the heart, and that the organ receives its impulse from the great astral heart, or the akasha, which has been said by all mystics to have a double motion, or alternate vibration, the systole and diastole of nature. So in this sense the valve in the circulation represents the abyss behind us that we cannot repass. We are in the great general circulation, and compelled, whether we like it or not, to obey its forward impulse. This place of dejection of Arjuna is also the same thing as is mentioned in Light on the Path as the silence after the storm. In tropical countries this silence is very apparent. After the storm has burst and passed, there is a quietness when the earth and the trees seem to have momentarily ceased making their familiar manifold noises. They are obeying the general law and beginning their process of assimilation. And in the astral world it is just the same. When one enters there for the first time, a great silence falls, during which the regulated soul is imbibing its surroundings and becoming accustomed to them. It says nothing but waits quietly until it has become in vibration precisely the same as the plane in which it is. When that is accomplished, then it can speak properly, make itself understood, and likewise understand. But the unregulated soul flies to that plane of the astral world in a disturbed state, hurries to speak before it is able to do so intelligibly, and as a consequence is not understood, while it increases its own confusion and makes it less likely that it will soon come to understand. In the Theosophical Society, as well as out of it, we can see the same thing. People are attracted to the astral plane. They hear of its wonders and astonishments, and like a child with a new toy in sight, they hurry to grasp it. They refuse to learn its philosophy because that seems dry and difficult. So they plunge in, and as Murna Jyoti said in a former article in this magazine, then they swim in it, and cut capers like a boy in a pool of water. But for the earnest student and true disciple, the matter is serious. He has vowed to have the truth at whatever cost, willing to go wherever she leads, even if it be to death. So Krishna, having got Aryuna to where the battle has really begun, where retreat is not possible, begins to tell his loved disciple and friend what is the philosophy that underlies it all, and without which success cannot be compassed. We should not fail to observe at this point that when Arjuna threw down his bow and arrows, the flying of missiles had already begun. 
We cannot say that when the philosophical discourse began between these two, the opposing forces declared a truce until the mighty heroes should give their signal, because there is nowhere any verse that would authorize it. And we also can read in the accompanying books that all the paraphernalia of war had been brought onto the field, and that the enemy would not desist, no matter what Arduino might do. Now there is a meaning here which is also a part of the great abyss the son of Pandu saw behind him, and which every one of us also sees. We enter upon this great path of action in occultism mentally disposed towards final victory. This mental attitude instantly throws all the parts of our being into agitation, during which the tendencies, which are by nature antipathetic to each other, separate and range themselves upon opposite sides. This creates great distress, with oftentimes wandering of the mind, and adds additional terror to our dark despair. We may then sink down and declare that we will fly to a forest, or as they did once in Europe, to a monastery, so as to get away from what seems to be unfavorable ground for a conflict. But we have evoked a force in nature and set up a current and vibration which will go on no matter what we do. This is the meaning of the flying of arrows, even when Aryuna sat down on the bench of his chariot. At this point of our progress, we should examine our motive and desire. It has been said in some theosophical writings of the present day that a spiritualized will ought to be cultivated. As terms are of the highest importance, we ought to be careful how we use them, for in the inner life they represent either genuine regulated forces or useless and abortive things that lead to nothing but confusion. This term, spiritualized will, leads to error, because in fact it has no existence. The mistake has grown out of the constant dwelling on will and forces needed for the production of phenomena, as something the disciples should strive to obtain, whether so confessed or not, while the real motive power is lost sight of. It is very essential that we should clearly understand this, for if we make the blunder of attributing to will, or to any other faculty, an action which it does not have, or of placing it in a plane to which it does not belong, we at once remove ourselves far from the real knowledge, since all action on this plane is by mind alone. The old hermetic statement is, Behind will stands desire, and it is true. Will is a pure, colorless force, which is moved into action by desire. If desire does not give a direction, the will is motionless. And just as desire indicates, so the will proceeds to execute. But as there are countless wills of sentient beings constantly playing to and fro in our sphere, and must be at all times in some manner acting upon one another, the question arises, what is that sort of knowledge which shows how to use the will so that the effect of the counteracting wills may not be felt? That knowledge is lost among the generality of men, and is only instinctive here and there in the world as a matter of karmic result, given as examples of a man whose will seems to lead them on to success, as Jay Gould and others. Furthermore, men of the world are not desiring to see results which shall be in accord with the general will of nature, because they are wanting this and that for their own benefit. Their desire, then, no matter how strong, is limited or nullified, one, by the lack of knowledge of how to counteract other wills, and two, by being in opposition to the general will of nature, without the other power of being able to act strongly in opposition to that too. So it follows, as we see in practice in life, that men obtain only a portion of that which they desire. The question next arises, 
can a man go against the general will of nature and escape destruction, and also be able to desire wickedly with knowledge and accomplish through will what he wishes? Such a man can do all of these except to escape destruction. That is sure to come, no matter at how remote a period. He acquires extraordinary knowledge, enabling him to use powers for selfish purposes during immense periods of time. But at last, the insidious effects of the opposition to the general true will make itself felt, and he is destroyed forever. This fact is the origin of the destruction of worlds myths, and of those myths of combats such as between Krishna and Ravana, the demon god, and between Durga and the demons. For in other ages, as is to again occur in ages to come, these wickedly desiring people, having great knowledge, increased to an enormous extent and threatened the stability of the world. Then the adherents of the good law can no longer quietly work on humanity, but come out in force, and a fight ensues, in which the black magicians are always destroyed, because the good adepts possess not only equal knowledge with the bad ones, but have in addition the great assistance of the general will of nature, which is not in control of the others, and so it is inevitable that the good should triumph always. This assistance is also the heritage of every true student, and may be invoked by a real disciple when he has arrived at and passed the first abyss. Quote, and when the great king of glory saw the heavenly treasure of the wheel, he sprinkled it with water and said, Roll onward, O my lord, the wheel. O my lord, go forth and overcome. Unquote. 